Let me know. Oh my God, let me know. Tell us that Excuse me about the warning, no warning at all. Hello everybody, it is uh, Thursday, it is noon, uh, regardless of the dim lighting. And it is, um, today we're talking about Reed Weir. Reed Weir is somebody, she and I go back a long, long ways um, from Newfoundland um, in the northwest part of Newfoundland. And anyway, we had this, uh, we were always talking back and forth, Reed is awesome. So anyway, here's the story. In 2006, I guess, beginning of 2006, uh, Reed was all set to have an exhibition called Flood of Furnace Cove that was going to be done with, uh, by the way, we just decided to talk about Reed a couple of minutes ago. So I have to, uh, who the heck was, um, anyway, we'll get back to that. So anyway, we were, uh, so Reed was, was getting very frustrated because the exhibition that was going to be taking place, that was scheduled to, to open at the Corner Brick Gallery in, in Newfoundland was, there was doubts as to whether it was gonna happen. Because like many artists, Reed had a choice. Uh, she could do the work on spec um, and starve, or she could not do the work and continue doing like regular wear and all that, to, you know, because anyway, so that was it. So that was a couple of days before Christmas, all right? And uh, so we're having this conversation and I was, it must've been 2005. Anyway, so I'm sitting there that night, I went home and I thought, okay, fine. How the hell can we make this happen? So the next day <clears throat> I called up Reed and I said, you know, here's the scoop. The reality is, is that I have to have something to sell. Um, and you also need to have some money to do the exhibition. Um, so how about if I buy the exhibition outright and for a year you will have an income, so it must have been 2005, you will have an income and with that income I will give you over, over, over 13 months I will give you an income and with that income, you can do the exhibition and if it opens up in corner, but wherever it'll happen. So, of course she thought I was crazy. Um, actually, a few people thought I was crazy, but anyway, that's what we did. So as a result of that, the exhibition took place. It was really, really exciting because also, um, what I then did was I approached some of our clients and I said, okay, here's the situation. This was, was, was what we're doing. And what I would like you to do is I would like you to buy one of the pieces. And um, so I was asking, <laughs> really what I think about it. So I was asking people to buy a piece, sight on scene, and they would get to pick in the order that they got on board, all right? So that way it would help me with the monthly payment. And also I told them, uh, I do not want you to pay me outright. What I want you to do is I want you to have 13 checks over. So every month when you got your, your bill and you saw that amount on your credit card, which was something ridiculous, plus you know, 29 cents, you will know that you have assisted a contemporary Canadian artist to actually do something creative. Now, the reason I chose 13 months <clears throat> is because Reed was getting checks for 12 months, but on that 13th month, I really wanted to feel that I was gonna have some money in my own hands. So that's why the 13 months, the 13 months was, so there was something about it all about me. So anyway, Reed did this extraordinary uh, exhibition called Flooded Furnace Cove, which she did with the painter. Angela uh, Antle. You're, thank God you're around, Brian. I don't know what the hell I'd do without you. Mind you, he just threw me into it. So Angela Antle, who worked for CBC, <clears throat> and so that was it. So then it got even more exciting because I flew out to Newfoundland to do a talk, and then I decided I was going to, and in coming back in the airport, I met this wonderful woman with red shoes, and she ended up sitting with me on the plane, and so we flew back together and we were talking and both of us said we don't normally talk to strangers. Yeah, go believe that one. <clears throat> anyway, so we got drunk on the plane coming back. So then, but she was from Newfoundland. So when I was flying for the opening at the 
uh, at the rooms in Newfoundland. And if you're ever in St. St. John's, you've got to go to the rooms. It is the most extraordinary museum. It's one of my favorite museums, and I've been to a lot of museums. It's just absolutely wonderful. Anyway, <clears throat> so then when I was going back, I called and I asked Sheila, and Sheila, if you through some freak of, uh, I lost my phone, I lost your number. Sheila in Newfoundland, you're a lawyer. And so if you haven't been disbarred and you're still out, but actually she would never have been disbarred. She was an absolutely incredible lawyer. That was the little joke there. But anyway, fabulous and with her red shoes. And we had the time of our life in Newfoundland. And we went to see the exhibition at Flood and Furnace Cove. And actually, I'm gonna show you. So here is a picture of the exhibition in St. John's. And the, uh, it was just absolutely incredible. And right there, right by this one, that's where I met Mary Pratt. And Mary Pratt was, she was wearing this incredible black lace dress, which I will never forget. We had a wonderful conversation. But to walk into a room in the museum and see this entire exhibition and think that, oh, this is all mine. Well, except for the pieces that I sold. But it was pretty exciting and, um, <clears throat> and an extraordinary experience. <clears throat> and this is a piece from, oh, first we're gonna talk over here because, which, and there's nothing here from Flood and Furnace Cove. I mean, mind you, during the flood, this guy may have been having a bath. This little sculpture, Reed's, now you've got to remember, Reed is trained as a painter who then, creative person that she was, decided to also get involved in sculpture. So Brian and I have this thing, actually it's more me than Brian, I'm always saying, well, you know, let's have a little bit of nudity. <laughs> so she sent these five little sculptures um, with, uh, with this nude, and they're all kind of similar, and they arrived, Brian, look at that's the dust. I know it's dust, leave it alone. Anyway, <laughs> so it's your dust, I know. Yeah. So anyway, so the piece arrived, the, we opened up the box, the five arrived, I got first choice, Brian got one, Don got one, Judy got one, and who's the other one? Tom and Rita. And Tom and Rita, the other one's down in the States. So um, we had them, that, that was about uh, five minutes and they were all gone. So anyway, so this was, this was of course after the flood of, at Furnace Cove. Now the Puffins, Reed figures that she did, I don't know how many damn Puffins. She used to do loon whistles too, but we don't have any loon whistles. And we sold loon whistles till they were coming, we were going loony selling loon whistles. But her puffins, she used to do these little figures like that. So one day, um, we, or we asked her, she said, well, I asked her, I said, just do us a hundred puffins. And um, so she swallowed and said, okay. And so the box of a hundred puffins arrived. And Brian's style of windows is a little bit different from mine. So I had all these puffins in the window, like a hundred puffins. It was absolutely incredible. And Brian, who would, would have put one, pedis, one puffin on a pedestal with a light <laughs> saying, you know, where are my friends? <laughs> no, not me. I went the whole crowd there. So we had all these puffins in the window. And then I also had a thing that said, you know, like 99 bottles of beer, but it was a uh, hundred puffins. And every time somebody bought a puffin, we took them out, we marked it down. And it was just one of those really, really fun things. I think one of the most fun things was was somebody of limited means coming in and buying a puffin and, and do it. And they were $25 at the time. We've since sold them for a lot more than that because they're hard to find. Um, but coming in and uh, and bought one on layaway. And that was one of, one of the really magic moments when somebody who didn't have a lot of money um, came in and just said, well, I'd like one picked out because they were all like so unique. They were really fun. So that was my, that's the puffin story. Sorry if I bored you. And then uh, from puffins, there were also, let's not forget the, um, the, what do you call these, caterpillars. But what's really cool about this caterpillar is that not only is it a caterpillar, and there were only two of these, um, when one of them arrived, uh, Brian snapped food. He's got, the, he's got the blue caterpillar. But look at this, because this is just like straight out of a fairy tale book. And on the back, you will see emerging from the caterpillar, I'm really glad the face is coming out front first. Breach burst would not have been. But isn't that just so wonderful? It's just magic. So, you know, you can have it there and you're looking at this wonderful caterpillar and then you can scare the shit out of your grandkids and tell them some wild story. And then you've got the person coming out just like they're coming out of a chrysalis. But, I mean, Reed Weir's, and as far as the, uh, the bear and the whip, 
well, maybe Reed will put a comment down at the bottom. Um, because, and here we've got the bear, okay? So, yeah. Now, the pair of lamps, which I got, I snafu'd those right out of her living room. Yeah, these are the only pair of lamps that she's done. They're straight out of Reed Weir's uh, living room. And um, this is me, this is Brian. Uh, both of us well posed. Uh, but yeah, they're absolutely, absolutely wonderful. And you know, we're, we're revisiting the fracking thing here because um, Reed is also quite political. So when they were fracking in Newfoundland, she thought, Let, let's have a, a new frackland. So she did these. And uh, these were the prototypes, which I think, prototype for Brian Cook. Brian has got to be the most avaricious collector you can ever get. He's got more prototypes than anyone. And, you know, someday when his collection goes to a museum, uh, it'll be pretty amazing. But I thought that was really cool that she wrote that down. So here's a prototype mug. And inside... That's all the chemicals. These are all the chemicals. So um, actually, the one who will really appreciate this is Mike, if he's watching that. That's our, our local chemical engineer. So there you go. So there are the chemicals. Okay. There's let's, the fracking. Let's now, up. let's move on. We're going to move up to the front and turn the lights on. Oh, we're going to turn on, oh yeah, we're going to turn on the lights. And uh, now the, uh, whoops, here are, here are the house sitters. Now, the Flood of Furnace Cove, the whole story behind the Flood of Furnace Cove is that 92 souls in, in Furnace Cove, and, and um, they're, they're watching. There's a flood. They're also watching for their men folk. Well, I mean, today they would have been watching for their women folk, too, because there'd probably be a few women out on the fishing boats, but not back then. But So this was this fictitious place, and these are the people. Now, there's a flood going on, and they're up on the roof. I absolutely, as a matter of fact, I have two of these at home. Do I have two? You've got one too, don't you? I don't have one of those yet. Oh, yes. <laughs> you noticed that, eh? <laughs> Brian is really, really sneaky. It's like, yet. Okay, but look at the, now one of the... the spin oh, me, shit. spin me the top part. Okay, right. there we go. Um, so, most houses don't turn like this. But look at, now what, what was really fascinating, and actually Mary Pratt was telling me this when we walked in, is that the faces, the people, actually look like Newfoundlanders, um, which is, well, I don't know if that's flattering or not, but this is what Mary Pratt told me, so blame her. And, uh, and she was really, really cool about that. But they're just, what here, I'll turn this one around as well. But the house sitters- I had them facing out the window. Yeah, they were looking out the window, but now it's time they looked in. They're absolutely, absolutely- and How does she do these? Well, what she does is, like the figures, she actually, she does them the same way that Judy does those tiny little birds. Okay. So she does the figure, and then when the figure is set to a certain degree, she takes a garret, I think it's called a garret, you know, and then she chops it all up into pieces, and then she hollows it all out, and then she reassembles it, and then she puts the slip on, and then she puts the washes on, because you can see, you, you know, her skill, as a painter, it really comes to play like, it, just in the way that the uh, the glaze is. It's all very, very painterly in the way that they've been applied. Um, so, and then she she lets them then dry. So that this was very much a labor of love, and it was really cool when the pieces all arrived. Now, the person who actually bought number one, uh, who rather had first choice, and when they got it, um, the person the the woman, the wife, she says, oh, I wasn't that keen, but it's now one of her favorite pieces. They really grow on you. Um, we have one in our living room and one in our family room, and they're just, there's just something about them that's really magical. But what was particularly, <coughs> that's not COVID, by the way, <coughs> that's dust. Okay, you know, if you thought that we didn't have dust, uh, anyway. So, but the thing that's really, can I do this? Yeah. The thing that was really, really cool is that Oh, and here's another one. This one's playing cards. She doesn't give a damn what ha happened to her husband. So she's <laughs> playing cards, and it's, uh, she's got an ace, a four, and another, and a two, I think. So she is obviously losing. So, but, and uh, to say nothing of the person here who's just lost. But they're, they're really wonderful. There's, there's kind of, um, yeah, they're just fabulous sculptures. And they really 
you know, when you think of, you could go and buy a major piece of Waterford or Moorcroft, and what you end up with is a major piece of Waterford or Moorcroft. But something like this, you've got a piece of Canadian history, you've got a piece of Canadian art, you've got something that um, keeps an artist going. Well, actually, I now own them all, so I can't say that uh, she's getting anything. But um, and now she's getting I, accolades. It's ac yeah, you get accolades. <laughs> but it was so cool, actually. And then what happened? The uh, the paper in Newfoundland wrote a story because uh, I guess you don't get too many private individuals uh, sponsoring a show for an art, especially with the way that we did it. Because I had no money, she had no money. But um, to the to the clients that did their, I think it was $163.29 or something, something crazy. But anyway, they got those and we got these, that's all pretty cool. And we still have some, so if anybody's looking for some house sitters, there you go. Um, so anyway, the, the thing is, is that you never know what you're gonna find and you never know in being a gallery owner where you're, what's going to, um, What's going to happen? Like here, you've got the reference. Now, for, just so you know, technically, this is insane. Because remember, this is all clay. That's not rebar. So <clears throat> she had to do these and figure out how she could fire it and have the figure so that it didn't, it didn't really collapse. And they, they're, they're beautiful, you know, but the... The painterliness, the, the quality of the, um, of the uh, oh, and here's the little, uh, I don't know why she's got a salt shaker. The briny pillar, I think it's called, or something. Oh, that's kind of interesting, that. Yeah, yeah but anyway, so they're really, uh, they're really quite wonderful on the maple leaves down there. And it was fun over the course of the year, you know, uh, Reed and I um, spoke frequently. Um, not that I was cracking the whip or anything, uh, but, oh, and then Sheila and I had this kick-ass time at the opening. We had so much fun. And then we went down, I think it was Duckworth Street, and ended up in a bar and got hammered. But it was just, <laughs> it was fantastic. So there you have today's little uh, uh, brief moment of uh, Canadian history. And remember, there are only two of these lamps. And, um, and, there's, and there's, there's this, and then th these. This is the last of our puffins. You know, the puffins were, I don't even have one of the puffins. And um, so there you go. And uh, this piece, by the way, is not for sale. This is Brian's. Brian's collection has been migrating to the shop as he prepares to move into his new place. And also, because I always like to have a little bit of water, which I never seem to end up touching. This, by the way, this mug is, this is awesome. This is a, a Wayne, not Wayne, what am I saying? This is a Walter Dexter mug, uh, absolutely gorgeous. And um, don't even think about it because it's already gone. This was uh, this is going to uh, a really incredible collection in Toronto. Mm. And there you go. Walter used to drink from that, and that was uh, and Brian, as usual, managed to purloin it right out of his kit. I shouldn't say purloin because <laughs> that means steal. Uh, Walter actually, because um, we were always after Walter for mugs, and that's the only one that we managed to get our hands on. So there you go. And uh, oh, and just so you know. Yesterday we were talking about um, we were talking about uh, David McKenzie, and um, um, we remember there were there were four of these. There no longer are. Matter of fact, not only do we sell the four, um, we got somebody has asked us, and there is another four that I've called that the artist is getting ready for us for somebody else. We had eight pieces arrive, and we have, <laughs> we have eight pieces three arrived. left. Four, yeah. And then this piece is, um, that piece is sold. And this, is this, is this the one with the lavender in the bottom? No, that's not. I think that's this one. That's a wood fire. That's the wood. Oh, and these are coil built, by the way. I forgot to mention that yesterday. And, oh, but one thing, just as, as a quick aside, because I didn't notice it yesterday, but I noticed it afterwards. Look at this one, which is very subtle. Now, at first, all you see are the houses until you realize that there's a, couple of boobs there and if you follow that along you've also got a butt and you have a woman no goat oh yeah shit there is another goat oh fuck oh, excuse me <laughs> there's another goddamn goat <laughs> where's elmo <laughs> there's another goddamn goat okay that's <laughs> That's an inside joke. So if you if you want to find out the goat joke, 
look at yesterday's video, but there is a goat there. And there you go. Brian, you better turn this off. <laughs>